Hello everyone and welcome to the 14th episode of the 8th series of Temple of Surf, the podcast. Today with us from California, John Wegener. We discuss with him about shipping surfboards, surf, surfers and much more. Hello, welcome to the show. Where are you today? I'm in Springville, California, which is up kind of in the foothills of the of the Sequoia Dons National Park. And uh, I'm in our little family cabin that we've had since the early 70s. That's uh, on a river that uh, became famous this winter called the Thule River. It uh, had a 50 year flood that uh, came all the way up to the bottom boards of the house and and, uh, did a lot of damage up and down the river. But luckily, uh, this old house made it through. I start every interview with uh, one question. What is the most important thing in surfing in your opinion? Yeah, I've, you know, I've been going back and, and listening to a bunch of the, you know, the, pot, the interviews you've done. And Thank you know, you. a lot of times the people answer that it's having fun, which having fun is incredibly important. But I was thinking about it a lot and it's not the full answer. It, I, I think the most important thing in surfing is to realize that you are a surfer. Okay. And that gives you a title of surfer, which means you, you know, participate in ocean activities and surf, you know, being in the water and everything. So really the most important thing in surfing, I think, is to protect our surfing ability in a sense that we need to just really see how important the ocean is to ourselves and that we get to go down there, you know, it's for free. We get to go jump in the surf and surf and gives us joy and it separates us from most of the population. So I think the most important thing really is in gratitude to that joy is to uh, kind of just at least realize who we are, what we're doing and the benefits we get from surfing and how we actually ought to best preserve it or make it so we're at least conscious that the ocean is so important to us and to do, to keep it important and try to keep it in the best working order as we possibly can. It's our job to protect the ocean, our surf and our beaches and everything. That's the most important thing a surfer can do. Yeah, we should not give it for granted, right? Whatever we, we have must be, must be protected, no? From... Yeah, well, if you lose it, you know, if you don't protect it and think about it and at least conscious about it, somebody will take it from you. Yeah. And so it's a bit, bit is a philosophical question, but do you think that in these days, in the modern days, we are losing the, the ocean, we are losing the ability to, to surf like it was uh, like in the last um, Well, we, we lose it in different ways. I, there's still tons of ocean to surf. We find more places to surf on the planet, you know, as we go, but... Um, when people get there, you know, a lot of times, you know, people build on the coast and, and don't let you trespass or whatever, which, you know, that, that doesn't harm the waves any. It's just the pollution really is that the main thing. You know, a lot of times I live in San Diego and surf in San Diego. And after big rains, we get sick when we go surfing just because the water is kind of dirty from one form or another. You know, you got the sore throat and, you know, when the rains come around, the cold, the cold also goes around the community because people, everybody gets a little sick from the uh, dirty water, I guess. So that's kind of the most glaring feature to me is with protecting the water is that if we can't jump in it because it's dirty all the time, that's the problem. I think the water was probably, you know, it's always been dirty, but uh, as a surfer, we ought to make sure we keep the water clean enough to go surfing it. What was the best wave of your life? Um, I think of a couple. The waves that I remember the most, I'm going to have to say, is at Malibu Beach, Malibu Point, on, a, on an alaya. So um, we were making a lot of alayas in the uh, mid-2000s, and it was pretty, you know, pretty happening. And um, I had a 7-8 a uh, alaya, and uh, it just... You know, at Malibu, it's a struggle to catch waves. And, um, but uh, it's the, one of the best ways for riding an alaya. So you get out there and, and 
jump in with the surfers on them. And I caught one, I jumped in on the backside of first point and I kind of drifted around the point and I caught a, it was a little bit over, maybe shoulder high, maybe a little above shoulder, but just a double up. And I was in the perfect place on the lie and I dropped pretty, pretty deep. Some waves make it from pretty far back. And, um, I rode it from way back on first point and just hauled ass and kept going through section. Every time I made it through a section, I was just like, wow, I can't believe I just made that section. And mind you, an Alaya board is a wooden surfboard with no rocker, no fin. You're riding, you're riding just the, the edge of the, of a board. And, uh, I made it from deep around first all the way to the beach, kind of by the pier and no cutbacks, nothing. It was just a screamer. And I, it kind of felt like I uh, traveled through time because I was just making these sections, highlining on a flying carpet through those, all those sections. I hit the beach and I, you know, you can ride in the lie right onto the sand. And um, I kind of landed on the sand. I just fell over in disbelief kind of because i've you know i've been surfing many years at that point and i never had a, a ride like that especially on a wave that that wasn't that big i mean it was only a maybe a head high wave and um it was the most exhilarating ride just because it felt like i was breaking so many um gravitational barriers let's say just that seemed like it was an impossible thing to do and it was just so exhilarating it was a great ride so you anticipated actually my one of the questions that i prepared for you about the Alaya. Of course, so that brings us back to Polynesia, right? How did you end up like shaping these boards? What, what brought you there? Um, well, it starts with my brother. My brother was down in Australia and um, he had a fascination with uh, making wooden long boards and uh, different wood boards. And he was, at the, he was in uh, visiting Hawaii and he went into the museum there and saw the Bishop Museum and saw just all the old ancient Hawaiian boards in the museum. And at the time, we didn't know anything about people riding them, right? I mean, we'd seen pictures, drawn pictures. You know, we've all seen those old drawn pictures of uh, that the uh, people drew back in the 1700s of um, people surfing. And they're kind of funny pictures, like they're kind of odd pictures of people riding on tops of the crest of the wave and different things. And so you, you didn't, you never really took those pictures seriously just because they weren't completely accurate. But so we saw that Tom saw the boards and, um, he was interested with them. And then, uh, so he went back to Australia and he was goofing around in his shop. But short story, he made a, a seven foot long board that reminisced the boards he saw in the museum. And he would call me and say he was, uh, belly boarding this piece of wood because he lived in Australia. I live in, in, in uh, California. And um, we had, I was just kind of tripping. I'm like, you know, my brother's a great longboarder. We're now in longboard at the time. Was known for his longboarding. And uh, to hear him that he was spending all his time boogie boarding a piece of wood was just a trip. But uh, was, we were, I went down there and visited him soon after that call. And in that meantime, um, they started, him and his friends started standing up on these wood boards and traveling down the point, you know, and uh, that was the beginning of it, of, of them getting the boards. And I got turned on to it and um, it started shaping them also. So it was just that what got me into it was just uh, the miracle, you know, at the time in, in 2006, nobody was thinking you could stand up really on a wood board and right all the way down the point on Malibu on it. It just hadn't been done in a really long time and nobody'd seen it. And, uh, and seeing that with, for me, what was so great about it is everything I thought I knew about surfing and shaping just got blown up. And, um, and so that, that's got me into shaping. I mean, I've been shaping surfboards already for 20 years or whatever. And, uh, and to shape the wood boards was really great and fun. And totally different, right? You need to have a total, I mean, I, I don't know if it's totally different, but you need to have a kind of different set of expertise or something is in common. Well, you can't transfer all your surfing knowledge to it. You have to relearn how to do it. I mean, of course, you've got wave knowledge, you got brake knowledge, but 
the actual standing up and riding is has to be relearned because it's it's different in how you stand learning it's more much more like snowboarding okay snowboarding on on a wave right you 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 tip your your rails to engage and so you got to learn all that at first you eat you just eat it it's embarrassing you go out there and you know you're supposed to be a good surfer and you're out there and you're just not you can't even stand up at first and so you know of course the occasional crazy talented kid can go out there and do it immediately but the regular folks of us have to go out there and take a couple's days to figure it out and so yeah it's it's totally new it's it's similar but new it's a humbling experience you know it shows uh, that <laughs> the <laughs> polynesian they were better than us <laughs> In yeah, the- yeah. Well, that's that's the, the greatest thing about it is the understanding that surfing, you know, was great a long time ago. Ancient history, what it taught us was that surfers, there were surfers and they surfed good, were incredibly talented, and of course, incredibly fit. And uh, they were great surfers. There was, you know, it's it. There's a lot of lore to these ancient competitions of Hawaiian, all the kings of the islands coming and having competitions, surf riding competitions and stuff. But, but what those pictures show, if you go back and look at the pictures that those people draw, drew, everybody's in the water. There's women, there's kids, there's men, they're all surfing oh. or riding the pipe bellow, belly board. They're all, it was a community, every, not everybody, but there were a lot of people in the water of all types, which makes me think there was a pretty awesome surf scene yeah um, going on and plus i guess also there was less thing to do or not to do maybe to distract you know people right and so going in the sea and try to have fun with something that's resembled to a modern pro or it was still a cool yeah 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 well it was just part of the culture surfing would have definitely been they made time for it for sure <laughs> That's what it looks like. It's hard. I don't know. I wasn't there, but just you got to read going back and rereading all these pictures and stuff has been really enlightening. Why and how did you start you uh, to shape surfboard? So we go back from 2006 with Elia, but we you, you told me we go back 20 years before. So what- yeah, I start I started shaping surfboards in high school, which was uh, like 1986 and 85, 86, and um, my brother shaped boards and stuff, but um, I got into shaping with my friends. We all went, got a couple of blanks at ET surfboards down in Hermosa Beach. And uh, we just got into my friend's garage and there were three of us, the three of us all shaped boards in there and um, just got into it that way. It was kind of my friends and I started shaping and, and um, we, uh, my brother and I each glassed our boards in my parents' garage. and. Just like, you know, kind of the classic story that like my dad would come home and the boards would be in the garage and, and, um, and there'd be, you know, resin splattered all over the floor. And he'd just look at us like, what are you doing? What, what? <laughs> can't you be smart enough to put tarp or something down to glass on top? And, and, um, so we made a huge mess in that garage and, and glassed a lot of boards. Well, you know, a lot of boards would have been 20 boards or something back before we got better places but just uh the culture in my little group of friends was that we make not all my friends shape but a a group of us shaped and we made boards and and of course my brother's influence of his shaping and stuff we it was just part of it so who gave you the best advice to um, to shape uh my best influence for shaping was hap jacobs yeah i had a shaping room next to him in hermosa beach for a while He'd gotten, you know, he, he took a lot of time off from shaping, but uh, he was shaping again in the mid 90s, he started shaping again. And pretty soon I was sharing a room at Shoreline Glassing with him. And, he, you know, he was just a professional. I was I was the definition of a backyard guy mm-hmm. and my stuff was, you know, fairly sloppy. And and I never I didn't really have any influence. I didn't have any better shapers than me ever showing me anything. So I was just doing it my own way. And the first guy that I really got to check out was Hap. And Hap still handshaped some boards at that time. And uh, and he's the ultimate perfectionist. And so uh, 
he was really an influence that helped me clean up my my shape work. How amazing is that? You know, like uh, a lot of um, very few people can say, uh, "Oh, I had like Ab Jacobs teaching me how to to shape," or I mean, not teaching, but being like a neighbor influence. Yeah, no, it was it was super special. It was uh, really, but a, he was a, a really great guy also, and so um, that was really nice. But there is one thing about those guys that era that all of them, I never heard that somebody said like, ah, that shaper it was like really, really bad. You know, I think, you know, the fact that um, the spirit of Aloha in a certain way, you know, something like mm -hmm. the ability for them to, to, to teach the new generation what they've learned in their own way. Yeah. Um, I'm Jacobs with that. <laughs> Never met him, but I guess he was one of them, you know, because I owe it to her. Well, it, it, it's funny as a shaper, when you walk in and, and look at somebody else's shape, let's say a, a, somebody that's getting into it, you walk in and you look at a, their board on the rack and you, you kind of cringe when you see some, you know, stuff that's, you know, something that could be fixed pretty easily, you know, and, and so it's kind of hard to help yourself from going and kind of saying, well, you know, you maybe want to do a little bit of this or that just to kind of help them look. Cause it's funny. So I've glassed enough boards to know in sanded boards to, to look at something and just look at it from the glasser's perspective. Like, Oh man, that stringer is going to be a nightmare for me to fiberglass and, and uh, sand. And so, yeah, it's the least you can do is point out to somebody, Hey man, <laughs> Do it like this, without being mean. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in your career, what was the biggest achievement? You know, like one thing that you are very proud of. Uh, my most proud moment was um, going to the Buffalo Big Board Classic in, in Macaha. If you're not familiar, uh, in Macaha, they have a, a contest at Macaha Beach that the Kialana family in Macaha families run and it's a classic contest um it's not like a normal surf contest it's it's more of a community event and um it's mainly people that families in that area come along but then there, there's other people there too and um they, they judge their contests differently it's not like oh this guy ripped it and did this turn and this turn there there's been these uh fun maneuvers created like the cockroach and there are these certain poses you do kind of like um classic poses of some of different kinds and the more of those poses you can fit into a ride while surfing makaha it, it, that's considered the best ride right instead of actually you know technically outperforming it's technical but it's, it's just different it's it's not a serious professional competition like me but uh but nonetheless it's uh it's an amazing hawaiian cultural event and uh when the ally you know it was, it was i think it was 2006 they invited us to go there to send some of uh wood blanks some 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 of our wood out there to send to some uh local shapers to shape along with uh, some of the local kids to get them involved with shaping and, you know, just getting kids involved in the art of surfboard making. Plus we brought, I sent some of our uh, boards out there to kind of get people who were able to ride. And so we got invited, my wife, Rosa and daughter, Sydney, and I went out there to, you know, to see the event, we got invited. So we went and and uh, just to see how much fun everybody was having out there on the boards. And we sent the boards out like three weeks before we went and the guys were already surfing them like, like we've never seen. I mean, they took it, like I said, they're just so naturally talented. They got on those boards and they were doing off the lips and turns and, and just absolutely killing it on these Alaya boards. And plus, and people, the board, the pieces of wood we sent out were shaped and they were already, they had all sorts of other boards. and. And they were writing boards that had been on the, the bathhouse since anybody could remember since the 20s or something. There was a board on the bathhouse that they, they took down and refurbished. And uh, I saw some incredible rides. But nonetheless, at the end of the event, during the ceremony event, Buffalo 
Keolana congrat, you know, thanked us for being a part of the event and uh, just, you know, sending some stuff out for everybody to work with. It just, he appreciated the, uh, our enthusiasm for the Alaya board. It was the most, I mean, it was the greatest thing I'd been a part of in surfing. It was because it was this, you know, I don't want to, it wasn't us that did it. It was the whole community, but just being involved with that resurgence of the Alaya board in uh, Hawaiian culture yeah. with the guys out there was just, it was a really great moment. And yeah, it's in Buffalo with, said thank you. So that, that, that was huge. Huge. It's like yeah. this seal of approval, you know, like means that you are doing the right thing. Yeah, well, just, you know, it just means that we're on to something. And like I said, just improving surfing, you know, it, and that that's another of my favorite moments is just, you know, I still shape a lot of foam surfboards, but just shaping a lot of wood surfboards has been, um, that's also, I think, one of my greatest achievements is just promoting wood surfboards, you know, made out of different materials is, is great. Okay. Yeah, of course. And today, wood surfboards uh, is a niche, but uh, there, are, there are a few uh, shapers that they still do, but uh, uh, always of high, very high quality, quality right? It's not, yeah, yeah. it's not something that you do for Instagram to start to shape wood, right? You need to have <laughs> commitment behind, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you're, if you're going to try to make a living off of making surfboards, you're committed no matter what you're using but yeah, yeah wood is wood is uh the whole nother thing is you got to get the right stuff and and do it all right yeah exactly and then the level of price is not definitely the one of a of a normal surfboard right very few people <laughs> afford it no it's it's right isn't it yeah it you know just you know there's there, there's different levels of wood boards but yeah i mean it, it yes i i know but like i'm talking about like kind of craftsmanship, right? So the price, yeah. some sure. the, <laughs> it's not like going in a surf shop and buy like a foam board made out of computer, right? It's no. not. Yeah. So going back um, to the most important things that are kind of my my questions for the beginning and for the middle of the interview, what is the most important thing in shaping in your opinion? Well, for me as a, a shaper, a lot of the stuff I do is custom work custom boards for people and most important thing for me to know and work on is you know who, who is this person and um where are they surfing to work with them on the design of their board i see i make i don't make just short boards or something i don't i actually don't make that many short boards so my clientele isn't really that 15 year old kid who wants to shred like uh you know like the top pros mine are usually more a little bit older guys who are learning that, you know, that little board isn't the board for me anymore. And oh. I want to get something a, a little bigger or more geared from where, who I am and where I'm surfing. Right. And so for me, just finding that out is what, um, now this is where I'm going to come back to say how to have the most fun, you know, is, um, my job is getting that surfer to have the most fun yeah. surfing. And so it's basically the design, getting the design right for that person to have fun because I want that guy to come back and order another board. So I want to make sure they get that one and, and they, uh, it's working for them in the waves they ride, you know? And so um, it doesn't always work, but that's, that's my goal. That's my biggest goal is to get them the right board. And you receive uh, a lot of uh, feedback from surfers? Or the majority are just buying your surfboards and maybe they find it nice and then come back buy another one, but they're not telling you, you should improve this part, you should improve the rail, you should improve. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's how you do it. You know, um, always when somebody comes to me and says that if, if I made the board or somebody else, I go, give me, give me the board you like and then tell me how you want to change it, you know, or how, how do you want, what do you want? What do you want this board to do better? And so I love feedback. I love to see if I've made them that board, you know, I always say, give me a picture of it. So it's right back in my memory, you know, which board it was or what this, what model it is of mine. And then, yeah, what do you want it 
the guy might say, oh, I'm not catching enough waves. I want to catch more waves. Well, you like the way this board turns? Yes, I do. So I go, well, let's keep the board similar, but maybe, you know, let's make it a little longer, a little bit thicker, you know, just kind of help them get that board or the board they like to do a little more. How do you see innovation today in the surf industry? Is something that is in incremental or in your opinion, there can be still something like it happened maybe in the 80s uh, or in the late 70s with, uh, uh, with the short board uh, revolution? Oh, that maybe was a totally different thing, but uh, there, there's, there's been like, especially in the surf boards, quite a lot of innovation since then, you know? Do you see? Yeah. It's like the question is, is incremental, so something like minimal, or uh, do you think that uh, we can still expect some great news? I think we have to expect something pretty great coming. Um, really, there hasn't been that much done in a long time that, you know, there's been site board design changes, but material wise, <laughs> not really, right? And so, there's the biggest change will be the materials. Something's going to come up. that's going to be really bitching, but I don't, I haven't seen it yet. And design, you know, you know like you just got to keep, uh, there's going to be a new design and it's going to be, there's going to be some groundbreaking thing. You know I mean? The foiling is pretty amazing. I think, you know, that's a pretty different thing, you know, and, um, it's crazy. It's, it can't go very wide, so friggin' dangerous for everybody else in the water, but, but that's a pretty cool innovation. So I see that expanding and something else is always going to come up, but I think the main thing is materials. You know, the <laughs> glassing foam is, it just doesn't seem like that's the final destination. I just see one material, the shaping of some material and it being done is probably, you know, like a wood board, like a, well, something like that. Something like that's going to happen. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, like technology can bring like uh, some material that will improve, like the resins, for instance, or or the surfboards um, themselves. You know, like uh, so maybe we maybe one day we will, we wake up with somebody, some scientist that didn't really think about surf as first, but maybe that will be applicable to the surfboarding. And for you. What is your next goal? If you can uh, project yourself, what do you want to achieve? You, are you happy yes. about the things going right now, or you'll be uh, like uh, you you put yourself in a different set of objectives that you would like to reach? Yeah. Well, I kind of would like to work on the materials and, and discover these the new way that to do boards, that would, that would be pretty nice. And I, I think about it a lot. I'm just not incredibly <laughs> creative or really incredibly intelligent, but, uh, I would love to keep working on surfboards and making them just better. That's really the most of it. I, with the, with surfboards, I, I just hope to keep, uh, making boards that people really like and, uh, I don't want to make tons of boards. I just, you know, my goal is to make boards, not, but not too, you know, not have to make too many and make a living out of it. That's the goal. Yeah, it's good, you know, because like people will relate to your boards more and more. At the end, there are certain brands, certain shapers that just want to be like the most famous one, whatever, you know, and some that are just like pretty happy with the customers that they have and mm -hmm. they or that they see the smile and the stock in yeah. the I mean, client and maybe the happiest thing is to see a grandfather bringing a grandson uh, and to shape the, their first uh, surfboard, right? There are right, different, right. different ways of, uh, of uh, getting accomplished, you know? In, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and you have to do different things. You want to make a lot of surfboards and you have to have a big factory and you got to do all this and you make a lot of a lot of trash and I'm, I'm not, I'm not interested in, in doing that. I, the, the goal is to make the, make the boards just really good for people as good quality and, um, as possible. And I, I like having my hands all over my boards. That's, that's where I am with that. I mean, I, I hope to, yeah, just, uh, 
create a great board that people like. And it's really great to say people that just come and say, I, you know, that your board really changed my surfing and I just have a lot of fun on it. You know, that it really helped me catch a lot of waves and great rides. As simple as that, as uh, powerful it is. So it's, uh, it's great, you know, definitely. Yeah. So um, you, as you told me before, you heard uh, how uh, my interviews are finishing. So we have a six Q&A session. So six question and answer. So for me, the question for you, the answer, please answer the first thing that comes up to your mind. Okay. Okay. So the best surfboard that you ever rode. Well, it's a good time to mention a board. Uh, the first board I had was a hand-me-down from my brother, which was a, a Rick surfboard. And it was shaped by Phil Becker. And uh, Phil Becker was another guy that was shaping, when I was shaping in Hermosa Beach, he was nearby. He was just right around the corner. And you could go over there and he, he sold, you know, he would sell you blanks and have advice and everything. And um, so I, I met him. The, the board... The board that I'm talking about was probably shaped in um, 1977, and I got a hold of it. And well, I started writing it in 1980, and it was a shape. It was a Rick surfboard shaped by Phil Becker, and uh, you know your first board that you learn to ride on is always your, one of your most important boards. And that was a great board. And just later in life, shaping and um, actually, I actually shaped some boards for Becker at the at the time and getting to know him was amazing he was a, an incredible shaper and uh an incredible guy just a, a maniac uh shaper and um he was uh he was a lot he was a lot of fun glad to know him. i'm really glad i got that board rode that board okay cool your favorite surfer of all time well of course uh, jerry lopez has left an impression on me that his surfing was uh was so cool but my favorite surfers that i still go back to watch are all are all those guys kind of into that middle 70s era era of um buttons and larry Bertleman and lydell and lopez and russell that that surf i i was getting into you know i was a kid and and that was so impression and that was um that's the stuff i think of first is, is my favorite surfing and then dane Kaloha. There's always the, your local guys that you grew up with surfing that your favorite, but, right. but don't, that was most impressionistic for me was that, that group. Okay. Personal question, your favorite song? Well, I have to say, uh, the song that really, I think of one, it's dark star by the grateful dead. Just, um, I spent a lot of time alone in a shaping room and, um, and you kind of go on your own shaping trips when you're in there and, and uh, you know, you're listening to music and stuff. And that song really takes me through the uh, ups and downs, the waves of, of shaping surfboards, those, those uh, long kind of jazzy, trippy songs. That's what I'm going to say. I, I, that's a hard question. It's <laughs> so much good music and so many good songs. But, good one. Uh, but that, I'm going to say that. Okay. Favorite surf spot? There's a lot. Uh, it's a, I mean, there's so many times in life, right? Uh, different places you live. I'm just going to say but right now there's a play, uh, Beacons Beach. It's not a hardcore surf spot or anything, but um, it's my go-to spot now. And uh, there's six waves down there, six, seven waves, and uh, just kind of troll around. And that's where I test all my boards, you know, a lot of my boards these days. And, uh, and so I, I have lots of spots that I really like, but... Um, that's kind of the quickest, simplest answer. Oh, uh, favorite shaper of all time. I don't want to get you in trouble, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Again, there's so many good ones that do so many different things. I I'm going to take that inspiration going back to uh, Phil Becker because um, he was such an incredible shaper. If you pick up lots of boards from the 60s, he shaped them. He shaped through the 60s, the 70s, 80s, 90s. He, he was ahead of everybody on the mid lengths. He was making mid lengths in the 80s. He was just an incredible shaper. He, he would shape 11 boards a day, five to six days a week. 
and he was just so incredible watching him use this. I haven't watched a lot of Shaper, so I watched him a lot, and he he was he was pretty amazing Shaper. Well, you you name it twice, so I I am sure I'm sure of uh, your appreciation for him. And uh, the last question: uh, best relationship advice or favorite relationship advice? You kind of got to see things see things through the other people's eyes and be open to it. I've been with my wife since ninety uh, two, and I'm I'm a greedy person. I like to surf <laughs> a lot, and um, and so at the time she didn't surf, and and so uh, I had to learn to see things through her eyes and things that she wanted to do, what she saw important. But that's to and and uh, Sydney, my child doesn't serve, and at 20 years old. And so I had to also have a good relationship there. I had to see things through their eyes, you know, and, um, and appreciate what they appreciate just to pull yourself out of your body and put yourself in theirs and, and kind of see what's important to them. And if you want to have a good relationship with somebody, you need to do that. Definitely. Or, and if you can't, then it's not, you don't need that relationship. Now with my wife, she learned to surf, you know, as life went on. And now we don't have as many conflicts as we did maybe in the early days, because now neither of us want to go meet somebody at two o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. We don't plan anything because now if, surf, if the surf's crappy, we'll go meet somebody at two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> but, you know, if uh, you said 1992, so 2022, 31 years, right? Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess uh, you were you were pretty uh, pretty able to read her eyes, and she read your eyes. So <laughs> we try. We, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool, fantastic. Thanks so much for being on the show with for with me today, and I look forward to talk to you very soon. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Ciao. Bye bye. Thank you. Hi, it's me again. I hope you enjoyed our today's episode. If you want to know more about us, please follow www.thetempleofsurf.com and all our social media. Mahalo!